Well, last week we talked about John's call to follow me, and we talked a lot about crowd frenzy, uh, even in the light of uh, Dr. King. But the particular text that we read last week was um, John proclaiming to those around him, to his many followers, behold the Lamb of God, and people um, following based on John's credibility, but also based on Jesus' one small statement of follow me. Scholars think that this, uh, that, that particular text was designed to fill in all the gaps uh, in what was happening in the gospel versions of this. So in John 4, we have one of the more familiar stories of calling the disciples, where Jesus comes upon these men in their boats. Um, and this is after John has been arrested. And so Jesus now takes up the common refrain of John's ministry, repent and be baptized. And as he goes along and sees these men working in their boats and doing what it is that they do to make a living, basically fishing. Um, there's some sense that the word of John has already resonated with many of them. We know that Andrew, Peter's brother, was a disciple of John and brought Peter to hear John and in that bringing also brought him to Jesus. But in this telling of the story, Peter and Andrew are together in their father's boat and Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Well, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. What would you say if somebody invited you to church that way? The only reason that this follow me, and I will make you fish for people makes sense is because it makes sense to Andrew and Peter, James and John, Philip and Nathaniel and the others who are called from their fishing enterprises, from family businesses, James and John, the son of Zebedee, who are uh, described as leaving their father in the boat to go and follow Jesus. Jesus had a wonderful way of making things real for your context. He told wonderful parables that took something familiar and related that something familiar to some aspect of the kingdom of God. So when we talk about becoming fishers of men or fishers of people, it's a bit anachronistic because in today's day, fishing is not a, uh, for some people it's a huge commercial enterprise, but it's not a father and his two sons going out to fish for the family or even doing fish to sell. How many of you fish? Does anybody fish? <laughs> Slowly raise the <laughs> I will not be a fisherman, and I'll tell you why. You may have heard the story in other contexts about me. I had a childhood trauma when I was about four years old in Kokomo, Indiana, where my great aunt Duffy and her husband, my uncle Ben, lived. My uncle Ben was a passionate fisherman, and being, you know, a man of not many resources, he would often bring home the fish and put them in the bathtub to clean them. And I was four, potty trained, and able to go to the bathroom by myself. Thank you very much. And I had accompanied my grandmother to Kokomo to visit for a long weekend in the summer. And so I went to the bathroom as I normally did, and I opened, turned, shut the door, turned around, and in the bathtub, there were all these dead fish lying there, staring at with their eyes. I ran from the room, screaming, telling my grandmother, could tell me it's not so, tell me. And she says, uh, till her dying day, she would tell the story that I came in and said, Grandma, there ain't no fish in the bathtub, is there? <laughs> I simply refused to believe this. So they tried to give me goldfish. I would not look at the goldfish. <laughs> As a child, I went to Shed Aquarium, I walked down the center aisle, I couldn't look at this fish. <laughs> the aquariums that are built into the walls, I just can't do it. I went to the Holy Land about 10, 15 years ago. The St. Peter's fish that they serve was passed down. I ordered a filet. <laughs> I was sent a whole fish 
oh. in the hotel. They had whole fish on the menu. People called up to our room and said, tell Terry there are whole fish on the buffet. And not to my guts. So, this metaphor actually just kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies because the notion of fish, I'm just not good with fish. But I'll move past my own trauma to share, <laughs> to share a word from the Lord. Fishing, if you've ever watched anybody do it, requires a whole lot of patience. Fishing takes time. You don't just rush out, bait up your pole, whatever you do, and drop it in, and things don't often happen immediately. One reason is that one has to know where the fish are, what kind of fish you're looking for, what the fish like. One needs to understand the habitat for the fish. If you're a loud fisherman, you're probably not going to catch a lot of fish. Am I right about this, Barb and Bill, Bob? You have to become a part of their environment, almost something familiar, and it requires some knowledge, some study of exactly who these fish are, what they like, what they want, in what environment do they feel comfortable. So if Jesus is calling us to catch people, if that metaphor is meaningful, and as Christians we know that it is very meaningful, what does it mean to go and fish? Does it mean going out and handing out tracts? Does it mean stopping people in the middle of the street and saying, excuse me, do you know Jesus? Have you been saved? It just doesn't mean standing out in front of signs. There was a guy on the campus once that had a sign that said, Jesus says, repent or you will die in your sins. And I walked past this man once, and I had to turn around and actually go back. And I'm usually not one who tries to confront people on the street like this, but it, the sign really bothered me. It said, Jesus says, repent or you will die in your sin. And I went back to him and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, you have the right to stand here with your sign. I said, but I'm a minister and I just think that there's perhaps a more loving message that we might offer to people about who Jesus is. And then I understood that this man, he spoke with a very heavy Eastern European accent. And he said, they took my stuff. They took my stuff. And then I realized he had been mugged. And he was hoping that somehow the perpetrators would come by and see the sign and know that, oh, God was going to get them for that. And so I stood and talked to him for a little while and said, you know, I have a feeling that God has already dealt with those people. But what I'm more concerned about is that you are now going to be a huge obstacle to anybody else hearing your message because you're really just standing here and spewing forth hate. People who don't know what we mean when we say Jesus Christ or people who have been hurt by the church when we speak or act or move with too much noise, with too much uh, what we think is passion but may be perceived as vitriol. When we're too loud near the fish sometimes, we can disincentivize them to even pay attention to what we're saying. Last summer at the assembly, there were people from the Westboro Christian Church who were a little group of families with little kids, these horrible signs, um, speaking out against homosexuality and vitriol, hurt, evil words being spoken, hateful uh, behavior and speech, loudness that's not conducive to even having people to stop and pay attention to what it is that you have to say. Patience we need in order to fish. Knowledge we need. Uh, we have a marketing committee that's been working and we invite any of you who's interested in joining us for meeting after church today. Um, but part of that work is not just snazzy slogans, but trying to understand who are we, what do we think we have to offer, and who are the people who we are trying to reach, not just for church membership, 
but who are we trying to reach for Christ? We know, for example, that feed the body and soul, we call it that because the fish sometimes don't respond well to Bible study. <laughs> and in my meeting this week, I talked with several pastors who have named Bible study something else. Because unfortunately, studying the Bible has come to be associated with people who are very judgmental and abusive. The things of God have become vitriolic and used in hateful ways. And so sometimes fish, if you even say you're a Christian, fish want to swim the other way. We know that there are young families who have needs, which is why our Sunday school is now held during the worship service so that families can worship. And we're glad that Sue gets to worship with us every once in a while. But we need other people to come and help make that happen. So we have to meet the needs of the fish, and we have to let them know who we are, that it's safe. You have to have things that fish will eat and things that fish will like. You don't want to uh, dilute the message of Jesus Christ, but you do have to be very careful about how you represent that telling. Just as Jesus always told parables that had an element of familiarity, the things that we reach out either in events or even be a postcard have to be something that are attractive, something that meets the familiar. We called our Bible study this year Christianity, how did we get here, instead of the history of Christian thought from Paul <laughs> through the Reformation. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> there are obvious things that we can do. But most importantly, as we fish, the moment of truth comes, as we all know, when people walk through the door and how calm and quiet and loving we are, how embracing we are, the kinds of questions maybe we don't ask right away. Um, it's not necessary to pull every piece of personal information from every visitor the first time they walk through the door, but just enough to let them know that we care about them, we're thinking about them, we want them to become a part of our, of our uh, congregation. So to fish, we have to not only have patience and knowledge, but use intentionality. But we must begin, as Jesus said, by repenting. That word literally means to turn and go in another direction. We have to already be headed in this different direction ourselves. Turning even maybe from the way we used to be church, even turning from the way in which we used to think Christianity should be. Living and being in such a way to draw people to this good news of Christ, to have the patience to know that it may be not our word that eventually sells them. It may not be my sermon, it could be the good food that Ollie serves in coffee hour. Mm. It could be a chat with Jim in the corner over some coffee. I'm thinking specifically of Jim Claffey, who always stands and chats with folks <laughs> in that corner. It could be just that little sidebar conversation that they have with you about something seemingly insignificant. It could be week after week, month after month, them paying attention and watching you. And here's where the patience comes in just so they can see that you really are that nice, like, at least most of the time. That the things they've come to observe and understand are still there on a consistent basis. As I was meeting with leaders this weekend, I almost wanted to change my sermon to preach from Isaiah 40, but um, that's the theme scripture of the New Assembly. But instead, I was listening to all these ideas that people have about attracting people to the church. And one of the things that I realized was missing was that element of patience. There's a story told of a fisherman who is of Norwegian descent and lives in Seattle. In his 70s, he retired uh, from his commercial fishing endeavor. He was a salmon fisherman. And during salmon season, he's only permitted to do one catch a week from his commercial fishing boat, which is entitled The Good News. But this 70-year-old now spends his time year-round casting his net in nursing homes. 
And this is what he does. He not only visits nursing homes, but he runs this organization called the Sunshine, S-O-N, Shine Society, which develops Christian materials for the nursing home population. Well, you think, well, everybody goes to nursing homes. Well, yeah, but listen to what Herm does. Herm found the closest nursing home about a block away from his church, and he invited any um, resident in the church who wanted to come to church, he'd give them a ride. Well, nobody wanted to go. So he calls the manager of the facility that next Monday and says, because we start a Sunday school class on the premises. And they had no guarantee of any kind of residence at all, but the following Sunday, Herm arrives with a guitar and a Bible, just went into the dining room, turned off the TV, just started playing a song, read a scripture, and gave a devotional. The first couple of weeks, nothing happened. For six months, nothing really changed. Herm came in, read a scripture, played a song. Nobody's paying any attention to Herm. And then, one day, he came in. The same people were in the dining room that were always there, but he noticed that outside the room, there was a huge group of people in wheelchairs who were sitting in the hallway outside the room, hoping to catch a, a glimpse and to catch a word of song. And before long, those people who were in the hallways got the courage to start coming in. What's the secret, Herm? Somebody asked him. He says, well, the music was the first draw, but nobody wanted to admit it liking church music. But he didn't give up. And over the next few years, they began to look at the needs of this special congregation. The hymnals, which had been donated from a church, were not senior friendly. The print was too small. The Bibles were too small as well. We all understand that. And so rather than give up after six months or so, because nobody was in the room, Herm has now grown this ministry to serve over 10,000 people. Now, I'm not saying we start a nursing home ministry. Although at one point when we were talking about <laughs> building that facility, we were down. We were like, God, this is what you've called us to do. But I just want to leave you with a word that says, if we're going to go fish, it requires some patience. It requires some savvy and knowledge about who it is that we're reaching out to, a world that is very unlike all of us in this room. In Isaiah 40, Isaiah is speaking to a people about God's promises and about going home and being comforted by God and remembering who this awesome God is. And the reality is, my friend Jennifer from Canada says, that those people never even knew what home was. They were never in Jerusalem. This contemporary generation, there's so many people who don't know who God is or what church is. They're not longing like we are for a certain sense of church. They don't know what church is. So how do we fish for them? It will take some patience. It will take the same love that you've always shown. But if we're going to respond to become fishers of people, it may take some time. So don't give up. Don't say, ah, we only got two responses on that mailing, or, oh, we've only got two kids this week. Take time to do the things of God, to be open to doing new things of God. And I am inspired by her, the salmon fisherman, that if we just keep doing the right thing and keep paying attention to who responds, the numbers will grow. The trick is making them comfortable walking through the door, coming on Wednesday night, or maybe joining us in pads, or finding another ministry that will attract people who want to be involved, or talking, uh, doing a better job of telling the story of the kinds of ministry that we do here in this church. Patience, knowledge, intentionality, that's what makes a good fisherman. God is calling us to become fishers of people. I hope you'll let your good ideas flow and share them with us. But most of all, I hope that we don't get discouraged because it will take a while. Let's get ready and go fish. <laughs>